few slides, and then oh, that sucks. And then we'll do uh, <laughs> that's right. it's it's dramatic right. effect. It's right. <laughs> dramatic effect, right? Uh, I got a few slides, and I've got a live demo, so that's gonna be fucking awesome. All right, so uh, this is like really, really basic intro talk. So if you've taken any uh, basic pen testing course that does uh, buffer overflows, this this will be kind of familiar. Uh, so anyway, what is it? I've got more slides other than right this uh, putting. Putting data into a buffer, a memory buffer that, could, that it can't hold a, you know, also known as shoving 10 pounds of shit in a 5 pound bag. Right, same concept. Right, so here's a code example um, of what you'd find about Pro So this is just a C example, right? So you have this function foo, uh, it's a instantiated uh, variable with uh, uh, size 12 bytes. Uh, and then down here, main, uh, oh, and then they do a stir copy of, of uh, the variable that's passed into the variable that's created, right? So down here, main, uh, all they do here is uh, pull the first argument from a command line uh, and shove it into the function, which then copies uh, bar as you see. Uh, so the problem here is that stir copy doesn't have any bounds checking. So you can shove like 100 bytes into bar and it will just shove it right into C without, without thinking about it. So that's a really, really simplistic example, uh, but that's a giant fail. Right? So here's a, a image look at it and I just stole these off of uh, Wikipedia, right? So here's your uh, memory space. Here's uh, your uh, variable that's created with a, a buffer of uh, 12 bytes, right? So byte zero, byte 11. <clears throat> so here's if we put normal text in there, right? So we just put hello in it, it fills it <coughs> up, top to bottom, right? And then now here in this example, we shoved a uh, pan load of A's into it. And then here actually we shoved a hex address, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, because, uh, because we didn't have any bounds checking, we just kept writing down the stack. Uh, until we, you know, overwrote things that are that are valuable and important, and I'll explain this in a minute. So finding uh, a buffer overflow, right? So fuzzing, uh, which is just kind of the the, the you know ability to shove uh, a bunch of data at something uh, to try and make something crash, right? To to figure out how you can you can control it, uh, you can capture it then in a debugger. Here's some examples of debugger. I'll be using Immunity Debugger. Uh, the thing I like about it is it has Python extensions you can add it to it. Uh, Coraline guys wrote uh, Mona, which kind of helps speed up the process for a lot of different things, and I'll show you some of those a little bit. Um, AFL is American Fuzzy Lop, it's kind of like an automated fuzzer. Spikes are a really simplistic fuzzer that you can kind of build your own scripts, and I'll actually <clears throat> show you one of those, and then you can build your own, but it'd be kind of weird kind of to me. All right, so first thing uh, are registers. Uh, so these are kind of the three registers that are most important. Actually, two of them are the most important. So ESP is the stack pointer, so that points to everything at the top of the stack. The stack is last in, first out, right? So anything at the top is the next is the first thing to come out. Uh, EBP uh, points at the bottom of your stack, you know, opposite of those ones. And then EIP is the, the address that we really want to control, uh, and that's the address of the next instruction, right? So point is, if I can shove something in the ESP, which is the top stack, and I can tell EIP to uh, execute that, then you know we need code execute. So we have some really simple goals. <clears throat> Crash the application to control AIP, uh, so we can control execution. Put shell code on the stack that we will then execute, uh, and then apparently profit. Right. So here's a here's just an example of a of a spike or how spike fuzzer works, and I'll show you how it how it works later. Right. So you have these these concepts of strings, which are just static strings. Um, you have uh, strings that repeat, so you can. Uh, repeat a string multiple times, right? And then you have string variables, and then these are the things that will actually get fuzzed, right? So, so, and I'll show you, it'll make more sense in a minute, but uh, this is, you'll use this and this most often, and this is the, the piece that you're actually, the, the piece of the application you're trying to test, right? Is whatever shoves in the, in the variable, the, the place where you would have input that you're trying to overflow. Right? Okay, so this will make a lot more sense when they get in here. So I have, I, actually, I just have just a quick note, right? So I have an XP machine. Uh, the reason I want with XP is because it doesn't have depth, doesn't have LSR, doesn't have any of that weird shit. Uh, you know, and exploits just kind of work because it's really nice. Uh, <laughs> it's great, right? Uh, I actually had this like 98% uh, functioning on a 1.7 box, but I couldn't get the shell code to execute for some weird reason. I, I didn't uh, take the time this weekend to go back and try and figure it out. So that, that might be a talk for next month. Uh, or, or future how to do that. Uh, and then I just have a Kali box uh, with kind of everything that gets started on it. So first thing I'll show you is a spike buzzer, right? So we have an application. This application is, is uh, SL Mail. It's like Seattle Labs uh, Mail. It runs like POP3, IMAP, and SMTP. 
Um, and it's got a buffer overflow and it's pop free um, uh, uh, service. <laughs> it actually, is a password service. But so we'll take Spike. Well, uh, you can't see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta figure out how to blow this bitch up. Control plus. Control shift plus. I got a Mac. There we go. Is that better? Better? Bigger? Bigger. Bigger. <laughs> go big. All right. So if we look at like uh, just a regular. So if we look at a regular, um, it comes with a bunch of sample um, files that you can use as, as fuzzers, right? So you have like string path variable, this could be anything, right? And then variable would be your return character, your new line character. And then it just keeps going through, see? So you've got apop, stat, list, right? These are all the commands that you can run inside of a pop um, once you're logged in. Uh, so it's testing all those. This, for our example, it's, it's a lot more simplistic. So um, we really just need uh, user and password, and and actually the password variable is the only one that's that's um, uh, vulnerable. But but we should test either one of those. Right. So <clears throat> if I go over to my little cheat sheet, wow, did it just shrink down? That's great. So uh, it has these really simplistic. Uh, has these really simplistic uh, tools that just generate. So, or the just create a socket and shove shit at the horse, right? So let's run this command. This is actually uh, not a good place, right? So all this is generic send TCP is the command, right? You give it the, the address you're going to, the port you're going to, the script that you're going to run, and then those last two variables are the starting point for the fuzzing, and the second one is the variable to start at. So we'll start at zero, zero, um, but one's actually, the, so, oh God. <laughs> right, right, right. There we go. Right. So now, just, so now you can see. Now you can see it's just. So it's going through each iteration. Uh, so <laughs> variable zero, uh, attempt one. Right. And so then it's just shoving this uh, various sizes of, of buffers at that at that user string in this particular case. Right. So it'll just run through this until it gets like somewhere in the like far hundreds, close to a thousand. Uh, just showing different sizes. Eventually, it'll show like a thirty thousand uh, byte uh, package. Editor. Right, so it just goes through. But we'll change this so we can see it a little faster. Right. So I change this to one. Now we'll see it probably crash pretty quickly. All right, so we'll let it run for just a second. And it should eventually crash, and we'll start getting a bunch of errors saying failure to connect. Live demo. All right, so while we're doing that, I'll go over here. So that'll take a little while. Uh, we'll fire up immunity, uh, and we'll attach to the process. So we just attach to the S, uh, SL mail process. Uh, everybody, everybody should be able to see that just fine. <laughs> right. So it's running. Is that debugger free? Yep. Yeah. Oh shit. Share crash. So it actually crashed now while we're at. Right. I can't blow that up. You guys are going to have to squint. Now, uh, so you'll see down here I got the access violation, right? And up here you can see these are the registers that I talked about. Here's the IP. Um, here's the ESP, the stack pointer, right? That's got a bunch of slash dots in it, which is just junk that the fuzzer was sending at it, All right? So we know we've got a crash. So where the easiest way to do this is actually to run a um, Wireshark in the background, so you know exactly which, or you can tell the last time it sent a uh, valid packet across, and then you can tell, tell how big it is, All right? So we know that. So all right, so we know we have a crash. Now we're going to look at uh, kind of fine tune this a little bit so it makes a little more sense. Uh, so I just have this uh, basic. <clears throat> I got this basic uh, Python script that uh, 
Yeah. All right. So we, we call, we import a couple of uh, objects, and then we uh, identify the host, the port that we're talking to, right? And then we open the socket, and then we send, you know, shit to the socket. But since we know path is, is the variable uh, that, or path is the uh, option that's uh, vulnerable, so we, we create our buffer. So here I just created a buffer of 7,000 A's. The price is somewhere around 4,500. Um, and I'll show you how we got to that. But. And then I just say, if, you know, if I can't somehow connect, I just exit out. So if we look, this should still, this is dead, right? So I'll just restart it. So this is, I'm going to have to restart the service and restart the community. So I installed Windows XP for the first time in like, I don't know, 10 years. God, it's been a minute. After I had to find it. And then, does anybody got XP anymore? Like, I thought I had it laying around somewhere. So we'll fire up now that we've uh, we've got it. We'll fire up uh, immunity again. We'll attach to the process. It always starts up paused. How do you zoom in on Windows XP? Oh, yeah, that's easy. A magnifier. No, I can't use that. It does it? <laughs> that, that even change? Nope. Yeah, we'll try that for now. It'll be a little hard to see in there. All right. So, so if you're looking at this, uh, your registers are over here. This is all the assembly code to make up the application. Uh, this is your heap, and then this is your stack. So, your stack pointer will point right here, and it's highlighted. Right, so now we're up and running. It starts pause. We'll start it. So now that now the application's running, and we'll just try running this. Oh my God, it's broken. Right, so we sent the buffer that was just 7,000 A's, right? And so now what we can tell, uh, so the application's crashed, and my, my resolution went back to normal. Well, God, yeah. <laughs> well, I could have brought it with a speed laptop, I guess. <laughs> that would have been awesome. <laughs> Uh, so things that we can notice, right? So EIP <laughs> register is overwritten with 4141 Those are A's and hex, right? And ESP, the stack pointer, is written over by a whole shit ton of A's. And we look down at the stack, right? The top of our stack is all A's, right? So now what we know is we know we can overwrite EIP so we can control uh, code execution. And we know here uh, that we can put some shell code down here uh, based on our buffer size. But the problem is we need to know exactly where in our string of 7,000 A's that we... Um, that we generate those four those, those four bytes. Uh, so there's this really cool tool in um, to list. There's a really cool tool in Metasploit. Uh, I think it's in user shared Metasploit framework tool pattern. Pattern create. Uh, I think it's the. Uh, Pseudo memory? Nope. Can't be wrong. We only have that. Oh, that's my friend. God damn it. Live demo. Oh, Fuck. Is that Ruby? It's, it's the can't. Uh, 
something like that. Okay, dash L, set point, right? So you do dash L, and then we can just say 7,000, right? So then it just, what it does is it pukes out this giant uh, pattern uh, of, of 7,000 bytes. So we feed that into our buffer, and then we can query the four bytes that end up in the EIP to figure out exactly where uh, where we override EIP so that we can, you know, control that whatever we want, right? Uh, the other way to do this, which uh, is why I mentioned Mona, so if you do Mona, Add and create 7,000, it'll do it for you. Uh, and it's right here. You can't, it's hard to see, but it's actually right here in a single screen. They dump it into a log file uh, in Immunity, and then you can just copy and paste it over. Um, but the, the real benefit is then I don't have to keep copying back and forth uh, when I do uh, pattern offset, right? So now I can just take this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, but I didn't want to like fucking redo it. I'll, I'll just. That's uh, right. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so then we'll just uh, replace our buffer with pattern. What? You missed the end of the table for nothing? Jesus Christ. You also want to end that. Yeah, you want to do it like that, it looks better. <laughs> <laughs> do, do it better. Terrible. Yeah, it is, man. Was, hey, at least I could get the passwords right. I was able to log in. And go, Damn it. All right, so we just had to restart it because I killed it. <laughs> Well, sometimes, uh, sometimes it kind of shits itself, and you have to restart the box, which doesn't take very long. Yeah, it's not starting. Yeah, see if I get the password right now. I'm probably changing all that stuff. So the problem was every time I attached to the process, the process would die again, which um, was some weirdness. So if I just restart it, it'll come back and uh, that part will work. So we can recap. So what I have is I have a pattern that's uh, uh, completely unique so that I can pull out the four bytes that I need. Uh, so I'll send that pattern uh, in place of the buffer, and then I can just query for those four bytes. Um, and it will tell me exactly what, what the what the offset is to, to control the IP. And then once I control IP, I can figure out how to get to the top of my stack. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> I heard the snicker. You were hoping. Yeah, he was. <laughs> I've never prayed so hard. <laughs> Thanks for fixing my thing. Yeah. No, this is VMware. Keep resizing it. Yeah, and optimizing it. It's all screwy because of the. Looks nice on the TV. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs>
All right, so now it's running okay, and we will kick that over again, right? So we got the crash again, but this time with EIP, we have like 4934749, right? So we've got this weird uh, pattern, not the A's. So that should be. Uh, so you can see, and then we've got a bunch of junk uh, on top of our stack, too. So now we should be able to do, let's see. Mona, PO, and if we enter in four nine three four nine. Looking for patterns and finishes again. Alright, so it looks for the pattern, and then here it's telling me we found the cyclical pattern at position uh, six seven zero two. So now I know the crash started at at uh, the EIP. Uh, those four bytes in EIP are at 6702. Start at 6702. I don't think that's right there. You said it was 4,000 something. Yeah, that was 4,000 something. Let's look again. Maybe I typed in something. Else. Maybe that's right. We'll try it. It'll be easy, right? So now what we can do, kill this. So what we can do to prove this? <laughs> Sorry, I can't find an idea in here. Thanks, Siri. That's all. So if that's the right, if that's the correct offset, what I did here was I just changed all the A's to go to 6702 and then I put four B's in and then I put C's everywhere else. So if this works right, uh, what I should see is four B's in EIP next time and then I should see C's on the stack. And then that, that just tells me that I've, I've hit the right uh, offset for EIP. <laughs> All right, so just just as we thought, right? So now I have uh, I have four two four two four two four two in EIP, which are B's, right? And then at the top of the stack, I had nothing but C's. So that was the correct offset. So now we know. So now we know exactly where to write um, where to write our uh, jump to ESP, right? So we said the top of the stack was ESP, so we want to be able to jump to it, and that's where we'll put our our shell code, right? So EIP is B. So now the problem is we have to figure out uh, where there's a jump ESP because we can't write uh, hex values to EIP. It's a read-only uh, register. So we have to find another jump ESP inside the program and jump jump us to it uh, uh, or execute it to jump us to the top of the stack, right? So again, Mona, uh, which is the, the Python program by the Coreland guys, and I can't remember all this. Yeah. 
So I have it written down, right? So you can do this Mona find, and XF4E is um, the code for um, a jump ESP. First thing you want to look at, though, is Mona modules. So Mona modules will list all the modules, and you can see all those. I know it. They're right there in, in green and black. This works, you know, if you're doing this at if you're doing this at home, this works on a, well on a large monitor with super good res, maybe not six feet away from it or 20 feet away from it. Right, so uh, it's kind of hard to see, but what they're what it's doing here is right. These are all the the base addresses for all the modules that are loaded by this application. But the benefit is here it tells you if it uses rebase, right, which uh, realigns the memory addresses of, on startup whether it's using safe SGH or ASLR, right, the address uh, layout randomization, uh, which was introduced much later, so it's not even an XP. So we want to make sure that whatever we find, uh, whatever module we look for a jump ESP in, doesn't have either of these two things. Uh, otherwise, the exploit won't work the next time we run it, or the next time the application starts. So what we, so if we look at it, there's actually uh, a module in here, a DLL that's bundled with the application. It's right here. It's SLM. FC.dll um, is highlighted, but it, it's false for both rebates and ASR, so we know that it's not going to screw with our our, um, our exploit once we get it done. So we can do this two ways, right? So we can tell Mona to look for any jump instances of jump ESP. Uh, any instances of jump ESP, which is what the search string looks for, uh, FFE4, uh, in that particular module. And it will dump out this really awesome uh, line again. And these are all the jump ESPs that are in that module. We can pick any of them. We'll just pick the one at the top. The other way that you can do this is with um, object dump, right? So I, I copied over the, uh, the DLL earlier. And dump it out. So here you can see the assembly code. Uh, so here's the, the same one that it found at the top of that one, uh, FFE4, and it's a jump ESP. So again, the point here is we want to put a jump ESP in the EIP so that it jumps us to the top of the stack, and then we'll set the, the stack full of shell code that, that will execute uh, when we want it to. Get this restarted so we can make our changes. So we go over here and we know the memory address. Right there. Memory address there, but we have to do this. So this is like, you know, the whole little Indian, big Indian thing that we all learned when we were in college. For those of you who are in college, maybe haven't learned yet. I don't know the gist behind it, but some asshole decided that they need to go one way, and some other asshole decided they need to go the other way. So we have to remember that. So on like power systems, uh, it's big in the on uh, x86 open systems. It's, it's a little lean in, so we have to reverse it. So it's slash x dev slash x. And if somebody actually knows the whole reason behind that, feel free to give a talk on it. I don't really care. <laughs> All right, so here what we've done is now instead of those four pages, <coughs> I put the memory address for that jump ESP. All right, and now this is all running again. So what we'll do over here is we will go to that memory address. All right, so I went to that memory address in immunity, which you can see right there, and I'll put a breakpoint there. Goddamn touch bar with no function key. <laughs> <laughs> the mask is work though, right? I know, but I, I usually use this with a detached. Uh, I, I know I use this with a with a Bluetooth keyboard. All right. So what I did was I put a breakpoint there. So when in the application I get to that point, it will pause the application again, so I can make sure that everything's working okay. All right. So if we 
should run this again. So it says here I'm at breakpoint. Uh, and if we, if we look, uh, this is the right memory address that I wanted to go to. It tells me I'm there. And then it tells me the top of the stack, which this is ESP. This is where ESP points to is a bunch of seeds. So if I, if I step into it, right? If I actually took that instruction, I took the jump ESP, and it just dumped me into a bunch of 43, right? Which are just seeds. All right, so now I know exactly where I'm going. I've got the jump ESP works. So now uh, we can introduce shell code. To give us uh, have a put that, but there's more, right? So uh, there's this concept, all right? So we shove a bunch of hex characters in there. Some applications don't like specific hex characters, so now we have to shove every hex character possible into the application to figure out which ones it doesn't like. Uh, and again, Mona kind of helps us really do that. So what we do? I got my little cheat notes over here. <clears throat> So if I type Mona byte array, it creates a text file with all the possible hex characters in it, but it also creates a binary file um, that it will use to compare it against. So if I go look for the text file. And then the binary file, so um, when I get to it, it can, it can uh, compare the input to the binary file, and that will tell me which characters were kind of messed up when it, uh, when it saw them. All right, so it created this binary array byte file, and then it created this text file here, which has all the X characters in it. And so I can just copy this. Now I'll just shove this into the place of the C. I put all the characters there. Perfect. Now when I run it, the C's will be basically every possible um, hex character. And we do this so that we introduce our when we introduce our shell code, um, the shell code will have you know any possible hex characters in it, and if it has some bad ones in it, the application will crash. The, the shell code that we introduced will crash, so we can actually encode it to remove those characters uh, if the application doesn't turn nice again. Do you have 56 reasons why applications don't like some hex characters? You know, I don't know. Probably because they're written by an idiot. Maybe. <laughs> I don't have the answer. I mean, bad programmers are everywhere, right? Sure. Uh -oh. All right, so if we run this, right, that will execute. Oh, crap, I've got to stop. <laughs> yeah, my bad. Greg, this process you're going through of like, basically trying something and then restarting a service, is that common? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you'll have to restart the service, uh, you know, hundreds of times as you do it. Uh, because, I mean, every time you send junk data to it, it, you know, crashes the service, so it dies. So uh, even when you're fuzzing, you'll, you'll do it a bunch of times just to try and get it right. Uh, this, is, this is pretty normal. This isn't, uh, just, this is just part of the process. What I forgot to do was uh, pause at the jump ESP. So I just put a breakpoint there again. And all right, so now we've, we've hit our jump point. And then here we've got like, uh, what should be all the possible X characters down here on the stack, but we, we've got some bad characters in there, so we know that, right? So we do, uh, I'll just let you see. So this command.
So what this command does is the Mona compare, and then you give it the file of the, uh, the, the binary file that I mentioned, and then here you give it um, ESP, the memory address for ESP, uh, the, the stash A and then the memory address for ESP, so it looks at the top of the stack. Okay. And you run it, and then it dumps out this really cool mapping. So there's really two ways you can do this, right? You can look at those characters and figure out what's messed up, uh, or you can run it this way where it kind of gives you the answer. And then it gives you this little, this little window, right? So it says there was correction after byte zero, the bad character is, is zero, zero, which is the first character in our, in our array. And if you look, right, this top line is what's in the file, what's in the binary file, this bottom line is what's in memory, right? And the first character is supposed to be zero, zero, and we got 29, right? And then everything's screwed up after that. So 01 is 20, right? So then what we can do, so we can just remove that. So this tells us, uh, this tells us recreate that file, but this time remove um, zero, zero. It recreates the file, then we don't have to do uh, everything we can go over here. Let me just go for it. Remove zero zero from our line, and then I'm gonna stop this for a sec. So Greg, I think it's yes, sir. It's Which one? Since zero zero is commonly a bad character for programs because it's treated as a special character, will terminate a string on things like. Oh right, yeah, yeah. It is. But yeah, zero zero is always almost always a bad character. I don't know if it's always a bad character or almost always a bad character. Yeah. Pretty much everything I've ever seen says it is a bad character. There's actually three bad characters in this particular uh, application, uh, but zero zero is always uh, a bad one. It sounds like sometimes it might be just because it's control character stuff. Yes. So anyway, all I did was kill the program, ran it again. We have different ESP address, so we'll try that one, and it should give us. Another one, right? So this one tells us, okay, corruption after byte 01. Right? So anyway, we'll keep doing this until we figure out what all the bad characters are. In this particular application, there's three, uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, A. Uh, so thankfully, it doesn't take too long. Uh, and then it will just come back and say the memory and the file matched, so there's no more bad characters you have to figure out, right? So for the sake of time, we'll, uh, we'll stop that part and just say we know all the bad characters now. Drink and spit juice again? Stopwatch. <laughs> <laughs> just checking. <laughs> All right. So uh, now that we know what the bad characters are, when we create our shell code, we can make sure to avoid those, right? So we'll use uh, MSF Venom, and uh, we'll use the encoder Shikataga and I, and then we'll feed it the bad characters. Zero A, zero B. Yeah, that's not right. Here's the bad. Here's the list of bad characters. So one oh eight. Oh, geez, not bad characters. That was on the Windows Seven. All right, so all we're going to do here is we're going to uh, create uh, a Python uh, a Python output uh, that we can shove into our, our code. Uh, it's uh, interpreter reverse TCP. There's our local host. 
There's a report that we're going to run it on. We're going to use the encoder static night, and then, then we list the, the three bad characters. And we do that so the encoder doesn't include those characters when it when it generates the output. Ben, why are you running it on port 443? Why the hell not? Because it's uh, easily hidden, right? Bury myself inside of uh, normal traffic. It's outbound from the target host to the grid output. That's right. Yeah, typically I would use uh, reverse HTTPS. So anyway, it created this is the shell code that you created, and then I can just it's in it's already in uh, Python friendly format. So I'm just going to add Just add some extra C's to make sure that it, whoops, add some extra C's. So now, what, so just to walk through it again, right? So I'm shoving a bunch of A's in the buffer up until I can control A and B, then I'm shoving a memory address for a jump ESP uh, to point me to the top of the stack, which should be the beginning of my buffer. But because we're encoded, I want to. Oh. Whoops. Because uh, we're encoding, I want to add some uh, space I want to add some space before my buffer. So I'm going to use uh, a 90, which is a no op, uh, and I'm going to put just 32 bytes of, of uh, basically nothing in front of my buffer. So when it decodes, it has some room above itself to decode. Uh, otherwise, it will start decoding on top of itself or Very on top of. What you call an op sled? That is what I call an op sled. That is exactly what that is. So if you've heard about an op sled, that's exactly what that is. So everything's running over here. So now we should be able to. Huh? Should be able to. I should have a. So I have this, just this, this is a um, uh, Metasploit uh, resource script. So this will just start up everything, right? So I had, uh, I'm using uh, the uh, multi-handler to catch the shell. I'm using the same, you know, shell that I put in the MSFNM line. This is the port. I need to change the, the local port. And the mic, right? No, that should be right. Uh, and then I'm going to set exit on session, right? So the first time you get the shell, if you don't turn that on, it'll exit. Uh, and then I'm just going to run it in the background. So that should launch everything. So the point here is now I'm running a, a Metasploit listener so that I can catch the shell that I created and shoved into the SL mail. Uh, and then that should work. So as soon as it starts, we can run our Python script. And so now we should be running. This is where the ultimate fail will occur. All right, so we hit our breakpoint. So if you look at this, um, we're at the jump ESP, the memory address that we want it to be, uh, which should point here to the top of the stack, which has a bunch of 90s in it, uh, which is our NOP sled, and then it should uh, roll down to our shell code. So if I just run the program, hopefully it doesn't shit itself, and it totally just did. Oh. You don't spell the breakpoint there, I did you? No, I'd actually, it actually terminated. I don't know what happened there. We'll just try it again.
I can jump through it one one instruction at a time. So I jump into my knob sled. Let's go to the other. And here's the start of my shell code, which should start decoding. Now you see it's I've got another bad character in there. So you can see it start to decode. Yeah, it just pauses. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll try one thing if that doesn't work, then I'll give up. And just pretend that it should work. So all I did was I just made my knobs a little bigger, like if I was stomping over the top of myself. Not sure if that worked or not. No. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, so pretend that's supposed to work. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure what's going on. I'll see if I can uh, figure it out and let the other folks talk. Uh, and I'll, if I figure it out, it's probably another bad character in there uh, that I missed. Anyway, so that, that that's pretty much the gist of how you would go through it. Uh, again, like like we mentioned, you're going to have to deal with the process and start it a whole bunch of times. Uh, because of, uh, of issues just exactly like that. Right, uh, what could go wrong there? Things like work. So there are protection schemes for this. There's DEF, which is introduced, I think, in XP Service Pack 3 uh, as an opt-in, and in Windows 7 as opt-in. Uh, there's stackinaries, uh, which are um, specific code written that are in the stack that if it gets overwritten, it freaks out. There's ways around that. Um, and then ASLR, which got reduced, I think, in Vista, uh, to randomize uh, address space uh, so that we can't, you know, just pick a jumpy SP because it's going to be different every time the machine restarts. Right? Additional uh, resources. So Corlan has a boot camp class. They used to have a foundations class that was really good that I took. Um, and now they have a boot camp class. I don't know. They teach it like Hack in Paris, uh, maybe only three or four times a year, but it's really, really, really good. Um, the OPSEC Pentis and Cali class has uh, basic buffer overflows in it. The OPSEC Cracking the Perimeter class uh, has uh, everything up to ASLR and uh, how to defeat DEP. Uh, there's book, uh, books, uh, Hacking the Art of Exploitation, No Starch book was a really good one. Uh, and then a couple articles, so FRAC 49, kind of like the article that everybody references is Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. Um, and then Corlan on his website uh, has a whole uh, series of tutorials that walk through um, how to do exploit development. How to do exploit development. So those are out there. Any questions? And if I figure it out uh, before the night's out, I'll hop up here again and show you what the problem was. I think it's just a bad character. Well, all of that was assuming that we had access to the actual machine that we're trying to exploit. That so you see the software, right? So if you can figure out what software the remote system is running, you can just spin it up in your lab and test it. But yeah, you'd have to have access to be able to attach to the process to, to debug it. Yeah, you'd want a working exploit before you actually go and test it over like in someone else's environment. Mm -hmm. Something hard to do or whatever. Yeah, you know, I mean, because you got to keep restarting it and figure out where everything's at, right? So you, you wouldn't be able to just do it through the noise. So that would be if you had it, or if you were just testing software, right? If you were just downloading shit. Uh, other places you can go, like if you go out to exploit DB, uh, you can search for. Uh, applications buffer overflows, then you have the exploit code and you can kind of walk through both halves of the thing yourself, right? So you have the exploit code, you can see what that author did uh, to figure it out and you can kind of follow their logic and, and that's a good way to learn too. Anything else? Did you guys get yours working? Yep. 